us this evening and we're looking forward to the conversation around family engagement. We're used to doing trainings like this more in conversation, in person, and having the opportunity for conversation. Um, we are hoping that even though this is a webinar, you will get participation from you, so don't be surprised if we ask you to type in some things and upload those in your little chat box, and we'll be doing our sort of group participation that way. Um, if you want to advance the slide, that's why I want. <laughs> um, so tonight, Jean Labana and myself are here as your trainers, and I'm Rebecca Breda. Like it says, currently I'm serving as the interim um, Young Star Director at the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association. Um, many of you may know me from my my other role, which is as the formal rating coordinator. So I've been involved with formal ratings um, with Young Stars since the beginning of Young Star in 2011. And Jean will introduce herself. And I'm Jean Labana. I am a technical consultant um, for Young Star. I work with group centers and family programs. I've been working in early childhood for well over 30 years. I started when I was four. <laughs> And I work out of the Milwaukee Week office. <laughs> All right, just a, a quick disclaimer. The contents of this presentation were developed under a grant from the Federal Department of Education. However, those contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the Department of Education, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. Okay, so this is our learning agenda. Like Andrea said, and I've mentioned as well, we've adapted this, and this is the first time that we're actually doing this family engagement training in webinar format. And so I've attempted to split it up into the two days. Uh, we will discover nearer the end of our time today how successful I've been with that. But our goal today is to actually get through um, family engagement, what does it mean, kind of what does it look like, um, and then a section on understanding parents and families, uh, some of the concerns and issues that may um, contribute to the success or that may create challenges for family engagement in your programs. Um, we will be reconvening with this webinar April 4th, and at that time we will wrap up the last sections, how to build relationships, strategies for engagement, and action planning for you and your program. So here's one of them that would be much easier if we were all in person, but since we're not, we do actually still want to know this about you. So if you would take just a minute and type in your name and what your role is, at your program, and then what you're hoping to get from tonight's session, or maybe not even specifically tonight, but from the family engagement training in general. And we'll give you a minute. Andrea is going to watch those names pop up, and then she's going to let us know that so we can kind of address, hopefully, some of the things and be able to tell you right away that, yes, we're going to cover that, or maybe make a note to uh, plan for some additional materials or training in the future. Oops, sorry, I got to scroll down. Forgive me. Okay, <laughs> so um, Brenda Williams, she says she's the manager director. And Lisa says, yes, type that information there, exactly. Um, Teresa, where do we type our, so right there in that box, <laughs> says question. Um, Kat Stuber's here, she's the administrative assistant and is looking for ideas on how to engage families. Carlene, Carlene is a teacher. Um, Sue is a lead teacher hoping to expand parent involvement and interest. Teresa, a family child care provider. Nancy is the director, owner. Um, she says, I can, sorry, I'm trying to, look, she's looking for reassurance that we're doing okay and how can we do more. Uh, Nancy C. Whoa, you guys are fast. 
<laughs> NCC works with toddlers and uh, keeps her director in line. Ha -ha. <laughs> uh, she works with Pat S. and Nancy Y. And I think all of you are on the webinar tonight, right? Um, she came wanting to clarify my understanding of family engagement and get new ideas. Lisa is the head teacher, wants information on how to engage families. Jenny is a director at an after school program. They're located in the school. And then some more family providers, lead teachers. Okay, well, thank you for those responses. That's great to get so much feedback like that. Um, a lot of those, a lot of you are just hoping to get a better understanding of family engagement and then maybe some ideas. So, uh, what I would like to say is that today our plan is to actually clarify. Um, really, what is family engagement? What does it mean? What is DCF looking for as well in their Young Star point? Um, this is not a Young Star. Uh, this is not a training for how you can earn the point. It's a training for how you can get families more involved in your program. But definitely, we will um, share information about the point. Um, and please don't hesitate to type in questions to Andrea as we go, so that we make sure we address things as they come up. So anyway, like I said, we're going to do the definition and more about that today. Probably in our second session uh, is when we will get into more ideas about how we're going to engage families. So I'm going to let Jean take a turn. There you go. Great. Well, that sounded really good. We have lots of people interested here. So let's talk about the four critical levels of family engagement. <clears throat> the first one is building strong relationships with children. And I think that's kind of the key that we all want to look for. Um, we have the most influence for children when they're bonded with us. Um, service planning for, for their children. So parents want to get involved with what's going on with their kids in your program and what their goals are. Um, Another level is the agency level decision making. So your program, what is your program doing um, to support families and children and having parents a, a part of that decision making process? What do they need from your program and how are they going to get it? The fourth level is community advocacy and peer led support. So we want to know what kind of services are available in the community what kind of activities are available for families, and how does our community support these families? So you probably are wondering, what's the difference between family engagement and family involvement? They're very similar, some very small um, discrepancies between them, and the way I look at it is, Family involvement is what the program expects from parents. So it may be the, the programs that we offer to them. It might be um, the, um, I don't know why words aren't coming to me here, about the opportunities that they have for being a part of your program. It might be that you have decided that um, an art gallery is going to be uh, one of the places that parents need to come, or breakfast with dads might be a a place, but it's things that you have decided and you expect that parents will be come involved with it. Family engagement is more goal directed and it's more coming from parents. What do parents need from your program and what are the choices that they can have to be a part of that program, to feel like they're a part of it? And I think it, it bears a lot about building relationships. Okay, so involvement is kind of like the things that they do right now. Family engagement is about relationships and whether they stay with your program or they keep coming back years after their kids have grown up and they still love your program and do things about it. And it's about engaging all families, whatever a family looks like. So it could be um, a traditional family or grandparents or foster families or relatives um, that are caring for kids or any other shape or form that a family looks like. Next, we're going to take a few minutes just to look at some different uh, ways of looking at family engagement. 
Um, if you've been in the field of early childhood education for any amount of time, you're probably familiar with Head Start and know that Head Start um, has, as one of its foundational components, um, family and community engagement and involvement. And so um, just very quickly, um, Head Start assumes that families are lifelong educators. Um, they assume that families are learners. These are just basic tenets of how, why, and how they have programming in the way and style that they do. Um, they believe in family engagement in transitions and family connections to peers and community. And finally, family connect. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, families as advocates and leaders. And this slide doesn't show all of that that well, but we just wanted to give you a sense of um, that's one style, one sort of overview of family engagement. And now Jean is going to take a couple minutes and talk about the Strengthening Families pro program and how they put together uh, family engagement philosophies. So Strengthening Families is another um, course that, that we offer, and it talks about what we as professionals can do to strengthen families and where um, our expertise comes in. Um, there are five protective fam factors, and if you've taken the course, you've heard about these, but let's just do a, a brief overlook at them. So parental resistant, re resistance, resilience. resilience. It can sometimes be resistance. <laughs> Resilience is the way that families react and bounce back from the challenging things that go on in their life. It's about the ability for families to get through these hard times. We all have challenges, um, and some more than others, but this is how parents bounce back. Social connection, meaning that parents have a network of people that they can talk to, um, commiserate with, uh, be supported by, and that can be families, that can be the people in your program, that can be other parents, and so we want to make sure that we provide some opportunities for parents to have social connections. Concrete support in times of need, so access to resources when um, they have things going on that we can't can't resolve, okay? So knowing where all of the resources in the community are, who to call, we wanna be connected to all those community supports. Um, knowledge of parenting and child development, well, that kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? We, we all come into parenting without um, a handbook. They just hand it to you and say, go home and be well. Um, and so it's good to have some, some knowledge of child development and parenting strategies. And programs can work with that by giving tip sheets to parents or offering um, child development classes or just being the resource there. Jean, can you just say a little sure. more about what parental resilience means? Sure, sure. So that means that we all have terrible things that happen to us. That's the ability to bounce back after that. So, for example, if... Um, someone loses their job. That's a pretty traumatic thing to happen in a family. How do parents bounce back from that and, and stay on task and figure out what's the next step to do as opposed to just falling apart and saying, I don't know what to do, I give up. So that's what resilience is. The fifth step of the five protective factors is the social and emotional competence of children. So we know that um, a big, component in um, in kids being ready for school and life and life is social and emotional competence. Um, and so how do kids get that? They get that from the people that are around them, from the people that care for them, from their parents. So we want to be good role models and also uh, be good instructors of these kinds of things. So allowing children to know what what's an emotional, appropriate emotional response to things. Um, and in preschool and early childhood is the best place to learn that. This is the time that we can make those kinds of mistakes that you can't make when you're 25. Um, uh, employers really kind of frown on you throwing yourself on the floor and throwing a tantrum because you didn't get your way or because lunch is going to be 15 minutes late. We want to know how to do that when we're four and bounce back from that. 
All right, so program strategies that strengthening families teach us. Oh, yeah, thank you. What are some kind of things that, that are going to support those, those five um, levels? Facilitating friendships and mutual support. So that means being friendly with your parents. Doesn't mean they have to be your best friend, but you really want to be there. So when they need somebody to let out on, you're there. Okay. We want mutual support so that we're all working for the same goals. So when kids are having issues, that we can sit down as a team, parents and, and staff, work as a team and figure out what's going on here and what can we do. Um, strengthening parents, so we do that by giving them lots of coaching, mentoring. We might have some, um, some parenting tip sheets that we would add to them. We know in the community where parenting classes are, where a parent coaches could be found, whatever parents are needing. Um, responding to family crises, and that could be in any different ways. We'll talk a little bit later about some um, toxic things in, in families, but responding to family crises are different for all different families. So knowing the, the mom that comes in in the morning that is so overwhelmed because she can't get three kids out the door dressed at the same time, that's a crisis as serious as um, – divorce or losing a job or those kinds of things. So we want to be there to respond to them. That doesn't mean that we have to be their social worker, but sometimes just having someone say, wow, it looks like you're having a really bad day is response enough. Linking families to services and opportunities. So we want to make sure in our programs that we know where all the services and things are in the community. We want a, a listing of those resources, and in most communities there are um, booklets that have those kinds of things. We want to know people in agencies that we can refer people to. Sometimes it's really nice to have a, a person that someone can call as opposed to saying, why don't you just go call birth to three, they can help you with that, to say, I know Liz down at birth to three and she would be really happy to help you with that. Having a name and a number is a, a wonderful way to link families. It's also a good thing to um, put up on your parent board when things are happening in the community. So if there's a parenting class that's coming along or if they're going to do some ASQ testing somewhere, that you have that up on your board and parents can see that. Facilitating children's social and emotional development. And that means knowing where kids are developmentally and helping them to take that next step so that when you have two-year-olds that are throwing tantrums, we know that's very de developmentally appropriate. And we're going to tell parents that, yes, that's, that's how a two-year-old reacts, but they're going to move on. We're going to, we're going to help them to problem solve. Um, we're going to help them socialize um, in a developmentally appropriate way. So we're not going to expect that a one-and-a-half-year-old shares their toys. We know that they're not socially ready for that. Um, so we'll talk to parents about that. Observing and responding to early warning signs of child abuse and ne neglect. So making sure that we take those mandatory reporting classes and that we know the signs of that and that we can respond to those. And when we see maybe something escalating a little bit, we might want to have a chat with, with a parent or offer them resources and not, um, and not be there as a judge, as a judge, but to be there as a partner. And then valuing and supporting parents. Some parents are harder for this than others, but we all know that, that parents love their kids to the nth degree. No matter how they show it, every parent supports their child. And so we need to value that and see that. And sometimes you have to look really hard to find that in parents. But I know that every parent that I have ever met has loved their kids wonderfully. So all of this kind of boils down into being partners. We want to be partners with our parents, um, helping them to ride out the rough spots, helping them to see, you know, what's what's age appropriate and what's not. We see lots of kids at an age. Parents only see one, and sometimes their expectations are unrealistic. Sometimes they're not, um, but we want to be a partner with them so that there's a conversation not just me reporting at the end of the day all of the terrible things their child did. If any of you have ever had challenging kids, you you know, as I have, 
Um, you hated the end of the day when you walked in. You could tell by the teacher's face right away that it was going to be a bad report. And <laughs> no, we want to be partners and decide what can we do together, and how are we going to respond to the to the needs that that child has, and also to the needs that the parent has. Well, and Mary has. More of a comment, I think, is there a point where a provider can become engaged and too close a personal friendship, and should there be a professional distance? And absolutely, there has to be, because you are not a personal friend, and that clouds your judgment. But there's a difference between being a partner and friendly and being an absolute out-of-work friend. And yes, you do want that boundary. But I would say that there's not any formula for identifying what that boundary would be. That um, you have to be careful as you develop um, your acquaintances with parents. And obviously some of them may be more interesting to you than others and you'd like to spend more time with them. Um, so it's something you really have to feel out as you develop those relationships and just be cautious about getting too deep with that it mostly that's for supporting or protecting yourself I would say Absolutely. too it's easy if you are yeah. a, an owner of a program or a family child care provider and you're supporting and you're providing these um, family support opportunities first in your program and then maybe emotionally on your part with the six or seven families that you might be serving you are going to be burned out and exhausted before too long because that's a lot of resource that that many families who may be high need might put on you or might need from you. So I, I think you have to be careful, but there's not a way to define it. And also remembering that you're the professional so that you set the ground rules. And Jody and Lisa, the question was just about um, if there was a point where a provider can become engaged too closely in a personal friendship and just clarifying that there should be a professional distance. They just asked me to repeat the question. Okay, so, great. I hope that's clear. Okay. Okay, um, the next area where we're going to look at um, family engagement is the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Most of us know that as NACI. Um, and NACI has also um, developed principles around family involvement and engagement, and those principles are included here. Um, so basically inviting families to participate in decision making and goal setting for their child. So this would be specifically linked to when you're maybe doing um, individual child assessments and then asking the parents to come in and you talk about what you observed during the assessment and ask parents if they have identified goals at home for their child. So these are goals specifically um, related to children. Um, the next principle, number two here, teachers and programs engage families in two-way communication. And that's probably pretty self-explanatory, but making sure that you are as prepared to listen as you are prepared to speak about um, any children. Number three, programs and teachers engage families in ways that are truly reciprocal. And reciprocity is very important. Um, it is important to families that they know that you value what they are bringing to this relationship of educator and family, um, and also that you, you provide things for them. So making sure that works both ways. It's not all top down. Um, programs provide learning activities for the home and in the community. And this is a great way for engagement, but it's another level, I think. It involves a lot of effort to plan for activities that can go home, and also to be aware of things in the community, either sponsor events in the community or even just be aware of them and, and pass that information on to families. Um, principle five of NACI is programs invite families to participate in program level decisions and wider advocacy efforts. So this might include keeping parents informed about um, local pol politics or statewide politics decisions that involve education, um, child care, things like that, and, and helping families be informed about those and also encouraging them to speak up for, for what they believe is right. And then the last principle from NACI is programs implement a comprehensive program level system for family engagement. And that's actually to a large degree what this training is about, is encouraging 
um, programs in the state of Wisconsin to be very intentional and to actually have plans, a comprehensive plan and system for not just involving parents in dropping their kids off and picking them up and giving a daily report, but actually really engaging them in their children's education. And the next slide is um, references the Wisconsin Model Early Learning Standards. And I'm most of you, it looks like 85% at least of you are involved in Young Star to one extent or another, and so you're probably somewhat familiar with the uh, Weemals. And um, <clears throat> you may know that there are five domains that children learn across these five domains. And so uh, the early learning standards were written and also um, incorporate a focus and an emphasis on involving parents in the education of their young children and having a cooperative relationship with the implementation of those early learning standards and helping children develop uh, across all five domains and over time. Um, and just so you know, there's we have some more information about this and some more and some websites too. We don't have any handouts. You didn't receive any handouts, and and I don't actually have any that I could send to you, but. If you're familiar with the Collaborating Partners website, you can actually just type into their search tool right on their website, uh, Parent Training, and they have tip sheets for um, how to use the early learning standards with parents. And they do actually have a tip sheet that relates to each one of the five domains as well. So next, um, we are going to actually, Jean and I together, introduce to you the 13 principles that Wisconsin has identified as being foundational for what, what Young Star would like to see in family engagement. And um, last week on Friday, Andrea emailed you the document, it's a Word document that's got the family engagement guiding principles. So hopefully you had a chance to actually look at this document. There are 13 principles included and they are on pages two and three of that document, but we are going to go through each one of those today. Um, we were hoping that you would take the time when you reviewed those to also fill out that self-assessment form and indicate whether or not you were already, your program was already using some of these principles or that you could see evidence of these practices um, and whether you feel like you're doing a pretty good job using those or you need help, whatever. I understand that you didn't get the handout until Friday and so maybe you um, didn't have any chance to work on it, but if you did not, Hopefully, while we go through this right now, as Jean and I talk through the, the principles, you will fill out that form, that self-assessment, because that will help guide your um, goal-making and decision-making even as we go through this training about what exactly you really think you need. So, okay. Um, and if so, you registered <coughs> after Friday, you obviously didn't get those. I just posted them in the handouts section of the webinar, and so you should have access to be able to download those right now. One is called Guiding Principles, and one is Guiding Principles Self-Assessment. And so what we're going to try to do is, we're, Jean and I are just gonna take turns going back and forth, and these slides, I know, I did I did not have time to add any anything cute to them, so we understand <laughs> that they're boring. But, <laughs> Important to look at. The content is important and shouldn't be hard. Hardcore principles. Um, <laughs> oh, I can't advance the slide right now. Oh, hang on. Um, Sorry, so uh, bear with us as we go through these, but we are right, going yeah. to try to uh, also give maybe some examples. And it's kind of general guidance for best practices, and you'll see a lot of um, the same things that we, we saw in other agencies doing this. So number one. Early childhood education programs encourage and validate family participation in decision making related to their children's education. Families should be empowered to invite and act as advocates for their children and early childhood education program by actively taking part in decision making opportunities. So this is the time that staff and parents get together and jointly make goals for their children. Um, parents should be 
encouraged to be advocates for their kids. And we saw that when we had the reciprocal conversations so that we are not always um, the, um, God, I don't know why words are not coming We're not to me. The, uh, the world's foremost authority. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so we want to be listening to what parents have to say um, and working together as a team. Okay, principle number two. Oh, sorry. Oh, I must be Andrea keeps go, taking control away from ahead. me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hate that when she takes control away. <laughs> uh, principle number two. There is consistent two-way communication that is facilitated through multiple forms and is responsive to the cultural and linguistic needs of the family. Communication can be program or family initiated, should be timely and continuous, inviting conversations about both the child's educational experience as well as the larger program. For all of you who are already involved in Young Star, some of this is going to sound like language that's involved with your rating. You're going to say, well, we have to actually have a policy about how to communicate with programs and how to make sure that we are communicating with them in the format that best meets their needs. For example, having a translator available if the language needs to be translated. Uh, possibly having somebody who can use sign language and um, or having materials in Braille if parents need those kinds of services for communication. Um, if parents communicate best by talking to you on the telephone that you make that an option for them. But if you have parents who really just, they don't have the time for that, but boy, you shoot them a text message and they're very responsive to that. It's, it's finding the pathway, the communication style that works for those families and accommodating that. And I know I hear all the time out in the field now about how you know parents communicate and programs by Facebook, they use Snapchat, um, there's lots of texting, uh, lots of times um, I've been at programs when staff take pictures of kids with their cell phones and immediately send them to parents. In some ways our communication has gotten a lot more immediate and therefore there's more of it. Uh, there are some cautions with that, especially with Facebook about posting kids pictures, um, confidentiality reasons and things like that, but, but there are some really nice avenues for uh, meeting families' needs for communication in a style that actually works for them. All right, three, programs should promote home language in early care and education environments. By supporting home language of each child while scaffolding their English learning, educators reinforce social connection, reduce the risk of bullying, increase child-teacher connection, and respect and strengthen the child's bond with their family. So this means about respecting who they are and what their language is. It means using those language with the parents, but also in the classroom, making sure that we have books in the language that the child uses the most, or labeling things in that language, um, and celebrating the differences that we have as opposed to um, having everything only in English. Even parents that are very fluent in English still really value that you have things in their language or that you ha share books or materials in that language. It just strengthens again the bond that we have that we are all doing this as a team. The fourth principle is the program supports families' basic needs of health and safety, are, and those are met by encouraging staff to provide intervention strategies and access to materials and resources so, that support the development in all domains. And these are the five domains, health and physical, growth, social and emotional development, language and communication, approaches to learning, and cognition and general knowledge. So this, this principle is basically um, just making sure that when we notice that a child may have a need, maybe a delay, or maybe maybe on the other end of the spectrum, they're actually precocious and could use more challenge that, um, you know, we work together with the families to make sure their basic needs are met, but also um, providing additional strategies and supports in the form of either materials and resources or recommendations and referrals so that other needs can be met as well. Jean? Families in early childhood education programs collaborate and exchange knowledge. 
Family members share their unique knowledge and skills through volunteering and actively engaging in events and activities in the community. Teachers seek out information about their students' lives, families, and communities, and integrate this information into their curriculum and instructional practices. So this again is the back and forth of knowing who your clients are and knowing what families are doing and what makes each family unique and sharing that in your classroom so that we know that every classroom is gonna be unique. And even if you have taught for 15 years, every year is different and you have different um, curriculum, you have different things that you bring in because each family brings something unique. Um, Teachers need to be the ones that are going to seek out that information. So they need some kind of a way to communicate with parents about what's unique about your family and what do you do that's really, really fantastic and, and how can you share that with us? Um, when I was teaching one time, we had a, a family that had a different religion than most of the kids in the school. And they came in and, and shared some of their their um, traditions. And it made the, the little boy that was in my classroom feel very special because he didn't he had something different than everyone else. Um, so we just want to make sure that every family feels like they belong with us, that they're not just gliding through my classroom for the year, that, that, that they are an integral part of our relationship. And for those of you who are actually going through either technical or formal rating process sometime in 2016, you may have already been introduced to the new point that's called developmentally appropriate practices. And this principle number five really um, is, is embedded significantly in that point. And I, you may already be aware that uh, programs are being encouraged to have um, families complete sort of a family information sheet about the children enrolled in the program so that we know more, st program staff know more about family cultures, family practices, things like that. So this you should see in practice in the 2016 evaluation criteria when you get rated in the 2016 year. Um, okay, moving along to principle number six. The program helps parents develop appropriate expectations of their children's social emotional development and abilities and increases the parent's ability to be more aware of their children's needs. So this is really getting at um, helping parents understand what's appropriate so that their relationship with their child or children is stronger and healthier uh, because they don't have unreasonable or unrealistic expectations for their children. Jean, number seven. Number seven, families create a home environment that values learning and supports programs. Programs and families collaborate in establishing goals for children across settings. So this, what I think it is, is about um, sharing what the kids are learning so that they can take it home, so that what we do in school and what we do at home are not two different things. So for example, if we have been talking about um, spring in school, Kids would take that home with their, their families and tell them about what we learned. Families would know about that if we communicate with them about what's going on in classrooms. So we want their home to be a support for, for our classrooms. So yes. quick clarification of this self-assessment. Oh. Lenny, the one we emailed, and I realized that not everybody got that, and so I'll make sure that we email that again uh, after the webinar tonight. Um, do we rate ourselves and the program, or just one of them? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. I would say rate what you believe your program, how you believe your program is doing, because what we're looking at is family engagement across the program. And I've been in a lot of centers in the last lot of years. <laughs> and um, there are, there are some, sometimes you'll go into a program and there's a classroom that has a particularly strong teacher, um, maybe has more experience, maybe just is driven or motivated by different things. And so it's possible for one teacher to do something very strong and other classrooms not to have that in the same way. So what we're looking at is how does the program do as a whole? Um, and then hopefully if you can identify how your program's doing as a whole, we can come up with strategies over the, over the rest of the webinar for strengthening that across the program, which should also end up strengthening it in specific classrooms. And we asked you to do the self-assessment
for yourselves, really, not as an assignment to turn into us. Right. 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 So we will right. not see this. You don't need to email it. Um, thank you for completing it. I, we thought it would help people understand the principles a little better. Right. And think about them a little bit more on a personal level, at least personal to your program. So, yes, we do appreciate that you have put some effort into that. So we're going to move on to principle number eight. Can it before you go Yes, on? yes. Right. So back to five. Okay. Okay. Are there samples out there of family survey assessments, places you recommend to look for these? There is a really good family assessment in the Strengthening Families course. Um, there, do you know where they would have to take that course to get it? No, they can go on Collaborating Partners and get it right off of there. Go on to the Strengthening Families course and just browse through the handouts and you can find that. I'll send that link in the follow up too if you don't know where Collaborating Partners is. Okay, and if you give me one second, I'm just checking to see something very quickly. If there might be links right in the evaluation criteria document, because this is when we were talking about the developmentally appropriate practice point, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, for starters, there are developmentally appropriate practice trainings available around the state. So you can, if you go to the Young Star website and click on the training link on the Young Star public website, um, there will be information about those trainings. And Rebecca's looking at the criteria for developmentally appropriate practices in Young Star. Yes, and actually they don't have a link there. Part of the reason that sometimes they don't link documents is because DCF encourages people to develop um, materials that work for their program. So if you would like some examples, I know that I recently received um, a web, like a child web that that covered all of the areas and of this development. And that's from the Wemos? Yes, it yeah. looked a lot like the one from okay. Wemos. Um, and so, and that met the requirements of this. So um, that would be one option and we can, I can make sure that Andrea gets that to email out with any other materials we'll follow up with after the webinar. Okay, I noticed that we, are already down to only 35 minutes left and we're only halfway through these principles. I knew this would take a long yeah. time. So we're gonna try to move along pretty quickly on these because we still have a lot more content to cover. Um, principle number eight, early childhood education programs and families place an emphasis on creating and sustaining learning activities at home and in the community that extend the teachings of the program so as to enhance each child's early learning and development in all the domains. I think this is about building on the things that are already happening in your world and in your community, maybe at home, maybe in the neighborhood, um, things that are that that kids can connect to because they see them other places as well. So, uh, and a large part of this is connecting um, what you're doing in your program to what families might be doing at home. So if you know a family's taking a trip to Florida or several families might be taking a trip to Florida over spring break, then possibly you actually do something about that, have some conversations and some content specific to some of that commonality among the families. Jean's going All right, to number nine. nine. Early childhood education programs create an ongoing comprehensive system for promoting family engagement by ensuring the program leadership and teachers are dedicated, trained, and receive the supports they need to fully engage families. And I think you're going to get a lot of that here in our second um, section. We'll talk about some, some skills in engaging parents and some, some strategies. Is it working? Uh, I believe so, yeah. yes. Here's uh, principle number 10, early childhood education programs will have working partnerships with family support organizations to help meet families' goals or needs. And these types of partnerships might involve working with a public library, might involve working with food pantries or um, birth to three, special ed teachers in the school district, other social workers. It just depends on what the family might need. Um, but 
some families also have issues that are more comprehensive and would, you know, maybe be connected to things that other families might think are unusual, like homeless shelters and, and things like that. So having an understanding of what's available in the community. Principle 11, program has a plan in place to help families and children that are transitioning, whether it be entering or exiting into a new setting. So that means this, and this is in uh, part some of the points um, in the Young Star new family engagement. Um, and then that means, do you, have a, do you have written policies that talk about when families come into your program and what are your procedures for welcoming them in and um, orientating them? orienting them, okay? Um, do you have a plan in place for children that are transitioning from one classroom to another? Do you have policies in place for children that are leaving your program? What do you send with them? How do you get them ready to move on to a new program? All right, okay, number 12. Programs respect, embrace, and actively seek to respond to the unique needs and strengths of culturally diverse children, families, and communities. And I think that pretty much goes without saying that, you know, you include materials in your program and opportunities for children to experience um, different diverse people. Um, and that it can include culture, race, differences in ages, um, <clears throat> gender, gender, and so that can that really is about non-specific or non-traditional gender roles for males and females, and then also abilities, differing abilities. Okay. And Jean will introduce number thirteen. And number thirteen programs understand the prevalence and impact of trauma, so they can provide services that support participant needs and strengths without judgment or prejudice. We'll talk a little more about that in a little while so we'll know what, what trauma is um, and how to, how to support those kinds of families. We're not expecting that staff are gonna be um, social service workers, but we're gonna know how do we respond to those kinds of um, trauma and how do people respond when they've had significant things going on in their life. Okay, this next question, um, I would like you to take a few minutes to um, identify a, at least one benefit for each category, one for parents, one for children, and one for programs or educators, and so just so that you can hopefully remember those categories. Here's a little slide to help you with that. So type these answers in, one benefit for children, one for parents, and one for programs. And, and then Andrea is going to share some of those with us. A benefit of family engagement? Yes, a benefit yeah. of family yeah. engagement. Yeah. I'm sorry, that wasn't clear. So why do we want to do it? Why would we even waste our time? So how, about, how about why would we spend our time? Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's much better. That's much better. And we're going to take... Two or three minutes? Yes. Or yeah. 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 Thank you very much. No ice. <laughs> I'm so fine with no ice. Do you need a key? Oh, you have some key. Is that so fine? Oh, yeah. <laughs>
How do I do that? All right, we're back. <laughs> I don't know how to make this go away. We're going to try we to go. take this picture off. Okay. So I, I've been, so lots of responses. Thank you, everybody. I'm trying to kind of summarize these, um, but I'm just going to read a few that seem um, sort of typical of what everybody's saying, if that's okay. Uh, let's see. So benefits for children. is One is that they see two environments who care for and work together for them. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Uh, for children, consistency between home and school, that's similar. Um, benefits for parents, so they have a better understanding of what their child is doing all day. Um, benefit for parents building relationships with families helps build your program, and they will be satisfied and re refer people to your program. Interesting. Um, Benefit for children, efforts at school are reinforced at home and vice versa. Benefits for the program, teachers can fully understand you, each child and better serve them. Mm -hmm. um, benefit for the program, things run smoother. Um, benefit for parents, helps parents remain connected to their children even when they're not together. Absolutely. Parents receive more information. There are lots more, but here's a final parent or benefit for children to help them grow and develop. Is that enough for you? Yes, yes, yes. Those are great. Thank you very much for taking the time to contribute that. I think ultimately what you can see from this slide is that ultimately parent involvement and engagement in their children's School experiences, whether they're early childhood experiences or in the K-12 system, result in improved child outcomes across the board. And so that's, that's obviously why we're all doing what we're doing, is to improve child outcomes so that the kids that we're working with are ready to go to school when they start the K-12 system and that they are able to be successful there. Sorry. And also lifelong learners, because this is where it starts. Yeah. Jean is going to um, introduce you to this framework of six types of involvement from Epstein. Okay, so Joyce Epstein is from John Hopkins University, and she's done some research on school and family and community partnerships. Um, she has identified six types of involvement. You do have this in your handout, so if you want to pull that out, you can. Um, the type one is parenting, and just being a, an involved parent and knowing um, what kind of a program you're choosing for your children. Type two is communicating, so communicating with your child, with your, te your child's teacher, with the program, making sure that you understand what's going on and that your needs are met. Type three is volunteering, so being a part of the program by giving back to it. So lots of different ways for parents to volunteer, bringing things in, helping with chores around the, the school, helping as a board member, lots of different volunteer things. Type four is learning at home. So when you see great things happening at school, it helps you to, to learn at home with your child and do the same kinds of things. Um, I think we see that a lot when parents learn the songs that kids are singing and you get that in your head and you can never get it out because it's in your car. Type five is decision making. So being a part of that decision making about what your program is all about and what they're offering and how they're going about doing that so that your voice is heard in that also. Type six is collaborating with the community. So partnering up with all the other things that happen in the community that affect um, early childhood, so the school system, the health care system, just about anything else that happens in the community um, affects the early childhood program. So we want to be involved in all those different ways. 
Knowing all of these helps us develop a more comprehensive and stable program. It makes our, our parents more resilient to our program, and it keeps them with us for a long time, even after their kids have left. Um, I've been in lots of programs where teenagers come back to see the program because they loved it so much and they were so connected. Um, and those are the things that, that keep you growing um, and building those relationships. All right. Okay, another activity for you. Um, so looking at those types, and we'll go back to that slide in a minute, but what I'd like you to do is think about what you're currently doing to engage families in your child care program and identify two specific things you're doing. Are you sending home newsletters? Are you inviting parents to a potluck? Are you asking parents to cut things out at home and send them back with their child so that they have an activity ready to go the next day, anything at all. Find two specific things that you are aware that your program is doing. Maybe you're not doing them in your classroom, but you can think of them, another teacher's doing. And then also try to identify which type using that framework that each of those falls into. And if you don't mind, quickly type those into the chat box and we'll, we're not gonna, um, mute the mic this time. We'll just read those out as they come in and we'll maybe try to get five or six of them before we move on. And I will go back to the key, the types, if Andrea, if I can, so that you can see these. There you go, while you are trying to identify what you're doing. Uh, field trips. Okay. That's volunteering. volunteering. A monthly newsletter. Okay. Communicating, another newsletter, homework for learning at home, yep. type okay. three volunteering, bringing in items for crafts. Yep, yep. all right. Using classroom dojo, what does that mean? D-O-G-J-O? -O? I don't know. Maybe, I don't that, know. maybe that's a like a, I, like it's like a training like for a karate. Yolo or? Yolo or, or <laughs> all right, know. whoever wrote that, clarify for us. <laughs> Uh, we have several family events throughout the year. Family dinner with soup made by the children during the day. Uh, yeah. Monthly good. newsletters, family nights, end of the year family celebration. Anybody have a um, like parent advisory council or a committee, um, some kind of board where parents might be involved in setting policy? That's pretty common. Well, it's very common because it's required in Head Start programs. Right. It's harder in other programs. So I'm not sure about that, but parent-teacher meetings when needed, okay. daily notes. Okay. Communicating. How about collaborating with the community by making referrals to birth to three or to other social services, um, allowing therapists of one type or another to come into your program to provide um, therapy, PT or right. speech therapy yeah. on site, that would, although the parent may not be directly involved in that activity, obviously that's a part of engaging mm -hmm. families in your program. Letting so, families know where shots are available, free shots are available, or clinics. A couple people say yes, we do have a family advisory board. Awesome. Okay. Good. Susan says she sends home notes when a child has a particularly good day. Oh, on a good day. That's great. Very strength space. <laughs> nice, Susan. Um, yes, referrals to birth to three. Okay. I sent home an activity to be done with the family every month. That's type four. All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. The person who had um, ex suggested a dojo. <laughs> she explained uh, it. Yeah, it's an app. It's an application that you can get for um, a, a tablet device that helps you share information with oh, um, okay. parents. Thank you. Wow, I learned something. Thank here. you for clarifying that. And we do see more and more use of tablets Absolutely. out in the field now, and especially when teachers are using them in that style. That's I'm I'm really impressed with that and the opportunity. One other thing that I saw one time doing an observation that I loved was a child said he wanted to call his dad at work and he couldn't. The, the provider knew that he, he wasn't going to be able to connect with them because of whatever kind of job the dad had. 
but she said, but we can text him. And so she got out her phone and he dictated to her and she texted and the child that the dad responded by text to him right away. And I thought that that was a great way to include the child in that direct communication. Absolutely. And so it's wonderful the way we can use technology to improve family engagement and involvement. Several programs um, participate in vision screening as well. Oh, yes. oh yeah. Care. Yeah, that's also a sure. really good one. Yeah. Excellent. I'm going to move on because now I would like to, since you're all warmed up at the keyboard there, <laughs> I would like you to think of some barriers to engagement. And if you could type in some things. Um, and Andrea will read those to us as well. Just sort of popcorn answers. What comes to mind right away when you think of barriers to getting those families involved? And I can forward the slide if you let me. <laughs> language. Oh, sure. Like, oh, okay, so a language barrier. Mm -hmm. Time and forgetful parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lots of language. Uh, they just want to walk in and pick up their child and go home. Mm -hmm. Parents' careers are very demanding. That's true. Yes. They live lives, lots of busy, different cultures. Parents do not want to engage. That's true. Cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> there, that's the curse of the technology. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes your hours may differ with the parents. Yeah, so that's okay. A, that's a good one. Several comments about parents wanting to leave quickly. Okay. Uh, I'm exhausted at the end of the day, and I maybe that's you, Nancy, or maybe that's the parents, but they're exhausted at the end of the day and just or both. Get home. And <laughs> or both. both. Yeah. And we can all appreciate Some it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, something that I think is very interesting is that although um, somebody mentioned a language barrier, what I didn't hear is sort of a lack of understanding or connection because of. Uh, maybe a bias or a frame of reference. And can I Sorry. forward to the note? That's Somebody okay. said culture. Okay, okay, culture. I think that that starts to um, segue into this ladder of inference. And frankly, I'm not, I don't love this um, graphic. So I, I find it confusing, but I think it says something that's important. Um, and it's, it's an illustration of how each individual person takes their own experiences, what they experience personally, what they see, what they hear, what they feel, and then they process that through their mind. Um, they select what data, quote unquote, to not only observe, but to focus on. Um, they add meaning to that. Usually the meaning that they add has something to do with something in their own past. Um, they make assumptions based on that meaning, and those assumptions are also usually related to some bias that they've developed over their own lives. They draw conclusions. Um, you adopt beliefs about the world, and then you take action based on those beliefs. And that is circular. That's a loop that happens over and over and over again. And I just call this a frame of reference. Every single person comes to every conversation, every training, every interaction, every experience with a frame of reference. Um, and so when you see the person who is leading the training, maybe you make an assumption about that person based on somebody that you knew who looked like that once before, or who sounded like that, or who smelled like that. Honestly, in my family, we have a joke about a specific name, which I'm not going to name because it's very common, but but we, in my family, multiple people have had problems with other people with this same name. And so every time we hear this it's name, Jean, we just, it? it's not Gene. <laughs> okay, good. Or Amy or Andrea. Okay. <laughs> Um, but every time we meet a new person with this name, we just think, oh, no, here we go again. And, um, and that's, what, that's sort of a, a joke about this ladder of inference. But the bottom line is we all have this kind of baggage that actually influences what we think about whatever we're experiencing. And this leads me to the next slide. And um, Jean is going to read a story to you. And you don't actually have the story in front of you. There is a handout. 
that is on the, that's connected to the web somewhere that, that says statements about the store or some I and know it's it, a true and right. false. Well, you're, what's it called? What's the title of it? Is it called the, so I the store that's too. The, so that's the one I couldn't get on. Oh, uh oh. Okay. Hang on, let me try now. I Okay, okay, so Jean's going to read the I'll story, read the story. And you don't get to look at the story, you just have to listen to it. It's about five lines, it's very short. Okay. A businessman had just turned off the lights in the store when a man appeared and demanded money. The owner opened a cash register. The contents of the cash register were scooped up and the man sped away. A member of the police force was no notified promptly. So... We can ask some questions about how you understood that story. And the questions are so, what Andrea is not able so, to load for some reason. Well, I only have the one with the... Okay, so I, I, I emailed you story two, okay. and it didn't get well, you to... Oh, that's I okay. Mean, so we will... So we'll just read sorry. them. And, right, we'll read them, and you should be responding. You do not have to type in your responses. I mean, the bottom line is you're going to know when you get to the end, what your answers were. So if this were me, I would need to hear that again. Okay, yes. I'd be glad to read it again. A businessman had just turned off the lights in the store when a man appeared and demanded money. The owner opened a cash register. The contents of the cash register were scooped up and the man sped away. A member of the police force was notified promptly. So our first question is, and this is a true or false. Oh, sorry. That's still scanned. No, these are. A man appeared after the owner had turned off the store lights. Do you think that's a true or a false? And you don't have to respond. Just think about I mean, it for a minute. Us. Okay. The man demanded money. Was that true or false? The man who opened the cash register was the owner. True or false? The store owner scooped up the contents of the cash register and ran away. Someone opened a cash register. Do we want to read all of these? or do we? Okay, because we can get the point. So the first one, a businessman turned off the lights. True or false? Is that true or false? We don't really know, do we? The story said a businessman had just turned off the lights in the store when a man appeared. So we don't know if that man was the owner or if he was, um, the owner may have turned the lights off, the businessman, whatever. Number two, the man demanded money in the story when a man appeared and demanded money. So we know that's true. We heard, we heard those facts. Number three. The man who opened the cash register was the owner. We don't know. We don't know who opened the cash register. We don't know if it was the businessman or the owner. It only says the man, and we don't know if the man was the owner. Number four, the store owner scooped up the contents of the cash register and ran away. We don't really know who scooped it up. It says the contents of the cash register were scooped up and the man sped away. So do you see how we made assumptions about the things that, that we heard in the story that may have been facts and may not have been facts? And sometimes that ladder of inference is where we add those things into it. We take our experiences and add that to the story. Okay, so there are some more questions, but we're not going to go through all of them because I think we, we made the point. Yes, we did. Did we make the point? Yes. I so. And can I forward the slide? Thank you. Okay, so the next um, concept that we're going to introduce here is about ACEs. And I don't know, I mean, you can raise your hand maybe on there if you have ever heard of the ACEs study. Anything about ACEs related to early childhood? And I see uh, one hand. Okay. All right. Two. Okay. All right. All right. Well, um, then you may not be familiar with this, but this is actually some research that's been done, and it's very interesting and informative in the field of early childhood, and it impacts health and safety and um, also academic achievement and things like that. Um, 
and there is a video that goes along with this, but because we're doing this in a webinar format, we would be able to show you the video, but you would get no audio. And so we did not even try to show the video. It seems like it would be pointless. Um, but we'll, I'll kind of explain this um, pyramid here. And when we do follow up with you, we will send you the link to the video because it is valuable. Um, so in this pyramid, what you see, and at conception, they mean, you know, uh, at the time a child is conceived and then born, that, that line there going up to death, that's the, that's the life trajectory for some, I mean, you know, assuming this is your whole life. So adverse childhood experiences would be traumatic events that occur in, um, in the earliest years of a child's life. And research has shown that depending on how the number of adverse childhood experiences um, that a child has, has um, is correlated with their social, emotional, and cognitive ability to achieve. And so the more adverse childhood experiences that a child has, the more likely they are to have some type of impairment socially, emotionally, cognitively. Um, as a result of that, um, they probably don't develop appropriate decision-making skills, um, uh, self-regulation and, and self-behavior management, and so maybe they adopt um, high-risk behaviors that impact their health. And this is, of course, over the course of their life. So maybe they take up smoking or um, start abusing some kind of substance. Maybe they um, start gambling because they need to take risks. Whatever it is, um, often the adoption of those behaviors lead to disease, disability, and or social problems and then can contribute to early death. And so what the research has shown is that trauma experienced at an early age, especially multiple traumas over time, um, can actually shorten a person's life. And there's more information when you can listen to the researcher when you get the link for that. But also, I don't know how many of you are familiar with TED Talks, but there are at least two TED Talks specifically related to ACEs. And one of them is delivered by a woman who's, a, I believe, a pediatrician. She's a doctor somewhere out east. And um, she, she does not come at this from an early childhood perspective like we do. She started looking into this because she was seeing significant health issues with a lot of the people that she was treating in her clinic. And she started to realize that they had some things in common going back to their very earliest childhood experiences. So it is interesting, and I hope that you will take some time to look at this. Because the reason we're bringing it up is because um, trauma impacts both our own. I mean, if we've experienced trauma, it's part of our frame of reference. And it also impacts how families are uh, prepared to cope with and deal with um, things that are experiencing at home, but then also how we might reach out to them as child care providers. And so it might impact their ability to even be engaged. And so I'm going to let Jean quickly review or look at this map of Wisconsin data. And this is ACES data specific to our state. So if you look at the colors in there, the actually, I'm sorry, I, yeah, look on the slide then. Don't look at your PowerPoint because your PowerPoint's in black and white. You won't be able to tell. So, yeah, so look at your screen. You'll see that the lightest colors um, are the lowest incidence of ACEs, um, but even the lowest incidence are 10%. That, that's a lot of incidence of trauma. And if you look around the state, kind of look where you're living and see how that affects you because you can see how it's kind of spread out isn't it and uh, go ahead oh and I just want to say notice that the it's four or more aces right because that's basically the threshold if a child experiences one ace in their early childhood that's usually not enough to have those negative impacts over time it's the threshold the tipping point seems to be right around four aces and the and the scale of it goes to about ten so I wanted to read some of the ACEs that might affect a person. And if you want to just keep a tally of which ones you have and how many you have, I'm going to do it kind of fast 
or should I not even no. do it? Go ahead. Work. Okay. All right. Number one, did a parent or another adult in, in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you? Oh, or you, sound, you sounded like you were going to say something here. No, no okay. I'm reading it and I'm, I'm responding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt. Did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Did an adult or a person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have, have you touched their body in a sexual way? Attempt or actually have oral, anal, vaginal intercourse with you? Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought that you were important or special? Your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? Did you often, very often, feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had dirty clothes to wear, and had no one to protect you? Your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or to take you to the doctor if you needed it? Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her? Sometimes often or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard? Ever repeatedly hit at least a few minutes or threatened with a gun or a knife? Did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? Did a household member go to prison? So now you add up all of those numbers, and you see where those ACEs scores are. You look at the, the map of Wisconsin, and you see that um, where, the, where the portions of the highest incidents are, they're not all where I thought that they were going to be. Um, so we know that some of the rural areas have, have just as high as, as the um, metro areas. Yes, so this is a lot of interesting data, and there's more of it. And I'm, we, we have a lot more to cover here related to trauma and toxic stress and how those things affect parents. But we are also out of time for tonight, and that's unfortunate. I was afraid of this, actually, because we had a lot to cover today. Um, so we are actually going to end today's session early at this point um, because because we need to, <laughs> because we don't get your time much past 8 o'clock. Um, so what we will do when we pick up on April the 4th um, is we will start here with toxic stress, um, which is going to be the next slide, but I will start with that. And, and you'll um, have those videos. Yes, we'll you. send yep. those to you ahead yep. of time, so hopefully you'll have a chance to review those because the, the toxic stress slide also has a video with it that we won't be able to watch. But so we'll send you information and some more handouts and any other um, things that folks expressed that they wanted um, that we can send, and we will try